Hey everybody, Dark Primitive here from Split Polygon and welcome back to my channel. And we are looking at how can we make realistic looking environments for people who are not that much into lighting and shading. So a basic level overview. Now we looked at how to make all these lovely shader balls and now we're going to start to dive a little bit deeper into texturing and how can we bring in maps to make our materials look nicer. Alrighty, I'm going to stop the render. I'm going to open up this. I'm going to click on this shader ball icon on the top, which is going to bring up the hyper shade. Now I'm going to select the object and I'm going to click this graph input and output connection. Now this is going to be my shader. If I press 4 on the keyboard, this is going to expand all of the parameters of that shader that we see over here. It's pretty much the same thing. Now what is this? This is what we call a shading group or some people call it a shading engine. This is literally a bridge between the material and the object. This guy hooks up into this and this guy hooks up into this and that's how we bridge them together. Every material that you create comes with an empty shading group and if you assign this material to this object, this shading group is going to get hooked up with this object. All right. So this one is important, but we don't use it a whole lot until we start to do displacements and stuff like that. So just to demonstrate something, if I go to Arnold shaders and I click AI standard surface, it's going to make a separate, uh, separate material with an empty shading group. This one is not connected to anything. So meaning I can delete it. So if I get this guy, and if you press one, two, three, and four, you're gonna cycle between how this thing is being displayed. I'm gonna stick to this one at the moment because I don't need to see all of the parameters. Now, this is the link going from the material to the shading group. The shading group is already connected to the, to the geometry. So that means that if I take this, and replace that connection. So if I click on the red dot and drag, it's going to make a line. So hold the click and let go once you get here. Now this is no longer pink, it's white because this is the white shader, which I'm going to make yellow. So this is how you can swap shaders um, without changing the shading group. All right. And this is important because if I'm doing some testing and I want to quickly look at something, I can just make a duplicate shader. I can hook up a texture to it and just swap it like this. Um, and that's going to allow me to preview a different effect on the same object. All right? Delete that for now. Don't need it. Now, what can we do with this? Now, we're going to talk about textures. Textures is some, when we talk about textures, People most of the time think about stuff that comes from the internet, like a JPEG or something you took with your camera and you use it as a texture and you're not wrong. However, there's also a procedural texture, a procedural that is based on math. So if I go to textures in Arnold, Arnold tab, textures, we have noises, cell noises, curvatures, flakes, AI image, AI noise. So this is a basic noise. Let's let's go with this one. It's a simple one. So if I click this guy, it's going to give me a bunch of parameters, and this is going to make a a noise pattern based based on equations that you that are behind you know the math of this it, that has exposed sliders. So if you tweak this, it's going to modify the algorithm, which is going to give you a different noise parameter. Let's see what's that doing. So grab this out color. I'm going to plug it into the base color of the shader. So now my shader is no longer going to be pink because this noise has black and white color. Let's check that. All right. So you can see there's a bit of darkening happening, but it's very faint. So let's say we take this guy and we say scale it 
to be bigger so let's say 5 by 5 by 5 so now we start to see the noise being distributed on the object and the way it's distributed is based on the coordinate space so if I switch this from object to world this is gonna be the world space and this is tiny object so we can have a lot of noise and you can use the UVs of the object as well it's gonna give you a lot bigger noise I'm gonna switch it to back to, ob to object if I change the color of this guy if I make it pink again and if I make this one I don't know blue I have pink and blue noise All right like you might think well this is kind of basic like yeah it gives you some random colors and annoy but what you can really do with this well you do crazy stuff with this actually so you have octaves that gives you more detail so it gives you more breakup between the colors the distortion is going to start to shift and distort as the word says uh, this which I can never pronounce and I'm going to even try is going to try to make the transition softer or sharper so if I make this it's going to start to blend in and add some variety and the amplitude is just a multiplier of the effect all right scale we already saw the offset is you can shift this left and right so if I take this guy and I shift it you can see the noise starts to swim Alrighty, and we're not going to look at these, these are you know, different kind of ball game. So, well, what can we do with this? Well, what if I drop the octaves to 2, get a little bit less detail, and I drop the scale down to, I don't know, 2 again. So it has, this is X, Y, Z, so X, Y, and Z. So now I have something more like that. And what if I change this to more of a mud looking color? So if I take and if I make this look more like mud, take this thing, and if I pick the same but make it brighter, and like, yeah, doesn't look much like mud, does it? Well, it will. So if I take the noise, if I duplicate it. Now, what did we say about roughness? Roughness says zero means black. Black means reflective. White means not reflective. Or, yeah. So if I take these and I make it black and white, well, but maybe not fully white because it's going to be like no reflection at all. Then I can use this into the roughness slot. Now look what's going to happen. If I take this and I expand this, if I try to connect color into roughness, it's going to be like, nope. Why is that? Because roughness expects a linear, it's a scalar value. It doesn't, uh, this one has three channels and you try to connect it into one channel. It's not going to work. Now, the good thing about it is because this is just a black and white image, it doesn't matter if you pick red, green, and blue, they're all black and white. So I can just pick red, and that's going to be accepted by the roughness. If I render now, we're going to start to see some interesting stuff happening. So if I select this, and if I start to modify, you're going to see that these areas are becoming rough and they do not reflect at all. So you see this is how this is breaking up. Now let's make it obvious. Let's reverse it. If I do this, now you see that the dark areas are not reflective and the others are reflective. So let's see if I have a coat, which I do. I'm going to remove the coat. It's going to make it a lot more apparent. So now you start to see that um, this is starting to break up. So this is not reflective at all. And these guys are quite a bit. So let's 
Uh, actually, let's not change this yet. So I'm just gonna tweak this. So this is gonna be a black, and then this is gonna be slightly more like that. So I want some sort of reflection. Now, yeah, it's kind of look like something, but what if I take this and I select my shader, I scroll all the way down to geometry, you have opacity and bump map. Opacity, self-explanatory, it's transparent or not transparent. Bump map is an interesting one. If I middle click on this guy, not left, but middle click, drop it into the bump map, it's going to make a bridge, just like this is bridge between these, the object and the shader, this is a bridge between the material and the texture. Now why do we need a bridge? Why do we need a bridge for this? Well, we need a bridge because the bump map has depth value, which means it's going to control how how much this is how the how much the thickness of this bump map is. So if I drop this down to 0.1 now we're starting to look like mud. Would you look at that? Now, if I start to modify some of these colors again, maybe we can go more reflective on this and more dull just to make the difference quite obvious. So now you see you have a dry surface that goes into a wet, into a fully wet surface. So now you can see simple noise can make some very, very interesting results. So. One thing to keep in mind is if you want to make things consistent, you're going to want your color and your um, utility, quote unquote, ramp that controls the other parameters, to have sim the same parameters over here. So, for example, if I change the octaves to 4 on the color, I would like to change them to 4 on this, well, not 24, to 4 on this one. And now this is going to give me a, you know, one-to-one -one representation and a completely different effect by the way and then I can take the amplitude and start to scale this on you see that that was starting to clip see this is still clipping so if I take the amplitude and I bring it down now it's not clipping anymore so you can do a lot of different you know fancy stuff on this thing now let's look at this into a more like a production level um, asset. So if I take all of these spheres, I have them grouped, I'm gonna hide them now and I'm gonna unhide my barrel that we started with. Now the barrel itself already comes with shader and textures like we talked about. Now let's break it down, let's see how this barrel looks like <clears throat> on a shader level. So if I go here grab this guy, I can graph it. I'm gonna maximize this for now. So this, I'm gonna rearrange this because I hate when the lines are crossing. There we go. It's much easier to see. All right, let's see, move this guy around. Uh, you can just adjust the hypershade a bit and save. Always save your work because when you work with textures, with big textures and stuff, Arnold tries to translate them and sometimes gets stuck and Maya crashes. So just be be aware, things will crash at some point. All right, so let's start the IPR. Now, what is making this barrel look like this? Well, you have a color map which is called a albedo. We have a roughness map and a normal map, which was essentially the bump map we had, but a, a little bit different. And uh, that's essentially it going into an AI standard. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, let's see how this looks like. So if I select this, if I click this button, this is called isolate selection. So if I click this, this is going to discard all the shading information and all the other textures 
it's going to only display what I have selected. So this is the color map. If you were painting your asset, this is what you're going to be paint as a color to make this barrel look like it is. So if you zoom in right in, you're going to have, you know, the rust dripping and you have the rope and the wood and, uh, you know, then whoop, I, got, I got below the ground and you get this rusty nails and everything. It's all represented in the color at some level. Then you have your roughness map. Your roughness map is very subtle in this asset because it's mostly rough. So it's mostly white. So you have some whiter areas, some darker areas, but it's mostly white. And then you have your normal map, which is um, representation of the height information. All right. Now, what is this? Now, this is called AI range node. And what it's doing, it's basically <clears throat> like a color correction node, kind of like almost like you have like a level levels node in Photoshop. It allows you to shift the colors up and down, make them brighter and darker right inside your render engine. Now, what will that do for us? Well, this is roughness, remember, which means that if I take this minimum, and if I said that the minimum is not zero, but it's actually 0.7, then this range goes from 0.7 to 1, which means the contrast of this is a lot higher. So you can see if I push it it's going to start to clip now if I what do you think it's going to happen if I render this now did you guess it it's going to happen it's going to make the barrel looks wet so if I click this check this out so I'm going to go out of isolate select <clears throat> excuse me and I'm going to rotate my camera kind of like this so now this barrel looks a lot more integrated in this Cambridge shot because it's kind of have the same <clears throat> level of wetness than the rest. And this is all controlled by this node. Now what you could do is you can go in Photoshop or Mari or Substance and edit this map to be darker and load it back in. But what if you need to tweak it on a shot by shot level? Then you have these utility nodes like the the color like the AI range node, which would allow you to do it instantly in the render engine. And the best thing is you can select the node and tweak it and see a live update. How cool is that? <clears throat> and something very cool is if you click this crop icon, you can kind of click and drag a selection. So only this will get rendered and this is going to get paused. So you can get all of the render power of your processor rendering tiny part of the image and this is going to be a lot more interactive so if I try to play around with this make it rougher and duller I can use smooth step smooth step is pretty much is going to tell you that it's going to clip the values so they don't go below zero and above one which is important for roughness so this is how you would do your look development and you can do your contrast you know, you have a lot of different controls. You can bias it towards white or black or gain it up or gain it down. You know, a lot of crazy stuff. So let's say I want to tint this to be a bit more yellow. Well, another color correct, another utility node that you can use is called color correct. So if you click on an empty space in Hypershade and you click tab, it's going to give you this, you know, search bar. And if you click AI color you have color convert and color correct you need the color correct one so you click this one and you see a red button means input so you go out color goes to the input out color goes to the base color now if I check this if I save and start my render then I have all of these color correction parameters that I can play with. So I can shift the hue, I can make it green, I can make it yellow, I can make it brighter or darker. I can, uh, if I don't want to use the hue, 
I can just um, make a tint effect just by using the multiply color and so I can tint the overall effect and this is very very useful so I use this a lot when especially with the skin shaders I would take the diffuse color like the the yeah the, the subsurface um, color uh, and I would tint it to be more red for example sometimes and I would plug it into you know different slots and you know it's gonna just save you a lot of time going back and forth between applications and you can desaturate it and you can bring the contrast up and yeah it's just like that you can try to integrate this into the shot a lot better now one thing that's kind of bugging me is you see this speckly shadow that we get that is controlled by the sample of your light so every light has this parameter and it's called samples and right now I set to one I'm gonna set it to three if I do that shadow is gonna be nice and smooth now don't go too crazy with this three to four is the maximum you should go with the shadow samples because your your render is gonna start to go insane all right this was a look of how we can use procedurals and file textures to um, texture our assets. And uh, we're going to continue in our next chapter with our um, environments. All right. See you in the next one.